Thank you. Thanks. OK, good. So good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, yes, so I'd like to talk about topological crystalline insulators. Um, and um, that's going to be for three lectures all today. Um, and and uh, before I actually get to that subject, since the introduction to topological insulators itself has been rather brief so far in the school, um, the first lecture this morning will be actually on topological phases in the very conventional sense again. And uh, in particular, I'll, I'll basically connect to what Ivo uh, uh, did yesterday and uh, talk about the Wilson loop characterization of topological phases. So this is a very, I think, convenient standpoint to understand bulk boundary correspondence and the, the bulk topological character um, of topological insulators. Um, the second lecture will be about uh, topological crystalline insulators in the more conventional sense, uh, they've been discovered uh, or thought about since 2011, 2012. And, um, and so um, that will be basically covered there, these ideas. Or actually, the, the ideas range even further back. And, um, and the third lecture today will be about a rather recent development, um, which goes under the name of higher order topological insulators. And uh, these are systems um, that have been discussed only in the last uh, few months. Um, but they are also topological crystalline insulators. So in that sense, it, it all fits together. It's just a sort of an extension of the concept, if you wish. OK. So, um, uh, so uh, again, if you have questions at any time, please interrupt me. Uh, as with all the previous speakers, that's important to slow me down and to make sure you, you follow along. Um, OK, so let's start with Wilson loops. Um, so um, I, this has a little bit of overlap with what Ivo did yesterday, but um, good morning, Andre. <laughs> and, uh, but th this time I'll do just to have the complete theory there, uh, the non-abelian case, which is nothing that should scare you. It just means that we are not talking about a single occupied band, but we are talking about a number, say, M of occupied bands, and the indices uh, that I will use for them is m and n. Um, and then, that, uh, then we have uh, Bloch states, if we have a translational invariant crystal, u, k, m. And out of these Bloch states, I'll form the non yet. No, you don't need to be sorry for interrupting. Uh, will you the or? Yes, uh, that's a good point. There will be lecture notes latex, but it will take a little bit. So uh, if you want to have it right now, you take your notes. But uh, in, uh, in a few weeks or, let's say, months, to be generous, you'll, <laughs> you'll have them uploaded somewhere. OK. Um, good comment. Uh, now the, uh, the non abelian Berry curvature is, is a vector uh, that we call A. And it has indices m and n. And it has a momentum dependence k. And it's just the, uh, the derivative, basically, the k derivative on uh, the nth band. And you dot this, or you sandwich this with the mth uh, band eigenstate at the same k. Uh, notice that I didn't put that i here that Ivo put uh, before. That is purely for pedagogical purposes. You, you know, just to be a bit inconsistent, that's what you encounter all the time in the literature, so you should just be prepared for that. Um, so now we can form the Wilson loop. And the Wilson loop is, uh, is simply uh, along a path L is uh, the path ordered exponential of 
the integral of this Barry curvature, and now you note that uh, this path ordering, because we have this non-abelian Barry curvature, is really important. So um, this A being now a matrix in this formula, you cannot just you know integrate it and and and, and then uh, take the exponential, but you have to path order. Um, so that guy is now also a matrix, right? So this this uh, W is an M by M matrix. That depends on the path L. Okay. And um, again, numerically, you can compute that as well. And and what you would do is basically uh, uh, you would take so to to get the N M matrix element of this guy, you take the N uh, state here, then you take a projector, let me call it P twiddle of K, then you take P twiddle of K, at K plus delta, and so on, and then um, you have P twiddle at say, uh, I'll just write K plus 2 pi just to make sure you have to go in some closed path, but it doesn't, doesn't need to be, of course, by closing it with 2 pi, and then take the mth band. And this P twiddle really is just the sum over all occupied bands, um, U, K, N, U, K, N. Okay, so the projector on these bands. And um, so now you see that uh, this quantity is not gauge invariant, right? Um, you see that if you change the basis, uh, because this now this non-abelian uh, construction, it's actually gauge covariant, right? It will change by the gauge transformation that you apply uh, to, this, to this outer part. But what is important is that the spectrum uh, of this W is gauge invariant. Okay, so we can think of the spectrum as something that that we can look at, and it should contain some physical information um, uh, uh, about the system that we study. So um, w one thing uh, that I would just uh, so so then we, the, basically the, the important thing is now how we choose the path, right? And uh, we had already two choices basically yesterday, right? If you choose a path that's just you know in some higher dimensional parameter space or in some case space, some um, some circle of sorts, then you would call this a Barry phase. If you choose a path that's basically wrapping around the Brillouin zone, sometimes it's more called a, a suck phase, and and that is the, uh, uh, the the case that we want to study. So in the following um, uh, uh, we will choose L to be uh, along the kx direction. Uh, spanning once around the full Brillouin zone, okay? And yes? So can, I, can I ask a basic question? Sure. As a non Okay, so the non abelianness is what, it's, it's a fancy word, but it really means that uh, these, this is a matrix now. So we have a multiple, uh, multiple bands, right? Multiple occupied bands. And then the point is that this doesn't commute uh, at different momenta anymore, these matrices here, right? So yesterday we had one occupied band, it was just a number, we can integrate, it's done. But now this is non-abelian, meaning non-commuting, uh, because uh, this matrix changes and is as a function of... Uh, no, yeah, the bands have different energy, but that's kind of um, mostly irrelevant uh, um, from the point of view of topology. So we think of an insulator as, as a basically dividing our Hilbert space, our single particle Hilbert space in two parts, occupied and empty. But what the sort of uh, detailed energetics in the, in the say, occupied part is, is basically irrelevant. Everything is occupied, so it's kind of the same for us. What is the line above the exponential and above the relation? Uh, above the, ah, yeah, so that's just for path ordered, so that you remember that you have to do path ordered exponential. Uh, Yes, if you only take the U1, yes, that's right. So, uh, so um, what she's saying is that if you have, 
only diagonal gauge transformations where you don't mix the occupied bands. So for example, if they are not degenerate, that would be a kind of a physical thing to do. Uh, then, then it's then it's gauge invariant. That's right. But in general, I want all U N U M capital M gauge transformations. Right. Very good. Keep on uh, firing questions. Um, okay. So and now I want to look at the for the rest of the lecture. I want to look at the path. Uh, in the x direction, a path that's wrapping all the way around the, the Brillouin zone. And then I'll, uh, just as a notational subtlety, you see that I underlined my k. That's something I usually don't like to do, because now um, I'll write k vector as of here, and that is um, ky, kz, depending on the dimensionality. So everything but kx. OK, when you see vectors now, it means that. And kx is kind of out of the game, because I integrate over it. OK, good, just for notation. Okay. So, um, so now um, I want to uh, uh, provide you with uh, proof for a statement that also Ivo made already yesterday. Um, and that is uh, about the connection between this Wilson loop and the position operator, or the eigenvalues of the position operator, which is you know these these Vanier charge centers. Um, and for that, I'll erase. or somewhere writing. OK. Um, so what I want to do is, um, this is meant to be a little bit. I want to show the spectral equivalence Um, between the operator minus i over 2 pi times the logarithm of w of k. And you see now I label my w by these momenta, which are perpendicular to the direction in, in which I integrate. OK, so these are all sort of good quantum numbers or you know, parameters for my Wilson loop. And an operator p of k x P of k, which is the position operator projected into the occupied bands, so the position operator in x direction. And um, this P of k is defined as sum over n and here I have Bloch. These are Bloch uh, eigenstates, so they're all orthogonal for all the k's, um, and I'm integrating over kx only, okay? Because that is basically the, the set of states, right? That um, that the x position operator can mix. Yeah. So so these are I still have the good uh, uh, quantum numbers ky, kz, and so forth for this operator, but the x quantum number will be uh, shuffled by the x position operator. Okay, so. Um, so let's just write the eigenvalue equation for this operator, and we'll see where we get. So uh, p of k x p of k. I'll call these eigenvalues theta of k over two pi, and and then an eigen uh, function psi of k. And that's supposed to be zero. Okay, so this is just the eigenvalue equation, and then an ansatz for this function. Well, what what could uh, you know what can we expand in? We can expand in the Bloch states at uh, this given momenta. So, okay, maybe I should be more clear. This is a big psi here. Let's call the expansion coefficients just f of k and n. They are for all these bands. And then um, the basis would be the Bloch states k and n. OK. So OK. So now I can take this state, apply it to the 
uh, operator and take a matrix element with any of these block states um, and see what I get. So um, the point is, so I take the block state at k and n. And now my claim is that, that you get the following. You get i times um, partial f of k and n partial k x, and that's the function of kx, plus i times the non-abelian Barry curvature element at k. Okay. And um, maybe a way to see this, um, uh, why this happens is, um, so you can rewrite uh, the x position operator, you can rewrite it as, uh, say, i times partial k x, right? And then what I basically have to com compute here, so these projectors, they don't do much because this is already a block state in the, uh, in the occupied bands. So then basically what I have to compute is um, sum over m dk tilde, let me say this is a k tilde because it's, it's, uh, it's in the sum of here. Um, then I have to compute something like this. Okay, well, this k tilde is now uh, basically uh, kx tilde, but then ky and kz, or they don't need a tilde, they're the same on, as on the other side. Okay, so, and now um, what we see is that this partial kx tilde can either act on this guy, okay, and then we get this term, or it can act on this guy, okay, and this is a Bloch wave. And, and now it can either, so the block wave, I'll just motivate this a little bit. Um, so the block wave would be e to the i uh, kx tilde times x um, times, well, actually it's like k, k tilde times like the position r, okay, times the u uh, k tilde m, yeah. That would be this block wave. Um, and so when it acts on this guy, it will bring down the position, but if I, once I integrate over the position, um, uh, sorry, if it acts on this guy, yeah, yeah, once I integrate over the position, I'll uh, get rid of this factor. And uh, uh, and the other part, when it acts on this u, will give me exactly uh, the non-abelian Barry curvature, right? So that's where it's coming out. Yeah? Yes. But only the KY, KZ, right? Yeah. KYKZ. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I want to show basically that this operator has the same spectrum as this guy. So I haven't yet actually involved this one, okay? So, so I only want, uh, want to talk about this operator at the moment, but we'll see now basically that this is connected to the Wilson loop, okay? So it's, we haven't yet you know, talked about the Wilson loop. And um, so now basically what you see is that this equation here, um, if you plug it or, or this, this thing here, yeah. Um, so that's meant to go in here and, uh, and then for the f, you have a first order uh, differential equation um, <clears throat> that, uh, actually I think I forgot the f, right? Yes? Actually I forgot the f here. Uh, that is the x direction, yes. <laughs> yeah, it carries an index x. Um, and that should be m, and that should be kx. 
sorry, I forgot that part. Of course, that's left over right here. Um, uh, yeah, it, so because the derivative is in the x direction, it's the x component, so it doesn't, it doesn't depend on the coordinate x, right? It's, it's just the x direction. Um, so, okay, so now we see this is a linear differential, now we see that it is a linear differential equation in, in f, um, and so we can just exponentiate uh, uh, the rest if we want, right? Also integrate. Um, so here is the uh, derivative. And so we take all the rest to the other side. And what you find then if you do this is that um, f uh, of k and n of kx is equal to e to the minus i. And then so we basically we have to define where we start our integration. And let's say we start the integration at kx equal to 0, uh, kx, kx 0. Uh, And um, then it's that times theta of k over 2 pi. So that is kind of an abelian factor that I can just integrate, right? This is from here. And uh, then I have uh, the rest is this path ordered non abelian integral that I can basically only write, okay, let me, times um, sum over m exponential path ordered from k naught, kx naught to kx, uh, some dkx tilde uh, of ax of kx tilde k. Okay, and of this path uh, uh, ordered thing, this is now a matrix, this exponential, I take the component uh, n m, okay? And um, then this has to be you know, times f m, f k m. Okay, so so now you are you almost see what what's happening is. Um, if we now take this integral around the whole loop in in uh, the in k space, so from kx equal to zero to two pi, for example, but I could have also started at some other kx zero, uh, then uh, over here we have exactly the Wilson loop. So these f states are also eigenstates of the Wilson loop uh, operator, right? And so we can we can basically write it as uh, sum over m w of k and m f k and m. And then I can choose, you know, for example, I can integrate from, from minus pi to pi or something like that, and then I, I get, you know, whatever the k0 is here. And this is equal to e to the i theta of k f of k and n of pi, for example, already. I could have written k0 here, this may be better, okay? kx0. So the, the, the two pi basically, since I integrate once around the circle, the two pi cancels here, and all I get is this, uh, uh, this theta, okay? So, uh, so now the question is, so this, this seems to relate to the eigenvalues of the Wilson loop somehow, right? So these are, this is an eigenvalue equation for the Wilson loop, so this e to the i uh, theta of k is an eigenvalue of the Wilson loop. Now, um, that, uh, maybe I should have, yeah, left exactly that equation. Uh, Okay, so um, we looked at the eigenvalues of this uh, operator, right? So we called them theta, theta of k over 2 pi. And now we relate them to the Wilson loop eigenvalues, which are e to the i theta of k. Now my question is, if I have m bands and I have l unit cells, how many eigenvalues does the Wilson loop have and how many eigenvalues does this operator have, okay? m occupied bands, huh? So 
So if I have M occupied bands and L unit cells, how many uh, eigenvalues does the Wilson loop have? The Wilson loop operator. That is not too hard of a question for you. You're just too tired. M times what was N again? N times N. So okay, then you wanted me to use N unit cells instead of L. Okay, so M, N. L. Okay, fine. So so what has how many eigenvalues? So the Wilson loop like was a matrix, right? How large was that matrix? M cross M. So how many eigenvalues does the M cross M matrix have? It has M eigenvalues, right? So okay, so so. W has M eigenvalues, and I'll call them E, so, and they are E to the I, and of course they depend on K, and let's say, uh, let's call them J, right? Okay, so these are the eigenvalues. And, and PXP, now how many eigenvalues does that one have? It's the position operator, right? So if I have L unit cells, so L is there. But there's also this extra thing that uh, actually I have multiple Vanier states because I have multiple occupied bands, right? Each occupied band is kind of giving me a one uh, Vanier state in the counting. So this has M times L eigenvalues, right? So, uh, but uh, wait, here I have uh, theta. So these eigenvalues are theta K J over two pi, so I'm, I'm missing something, I mean the factor of L. And the factor of L comes in because this relation here, of course, is only valid modulo two pi, right? So I can shift the position operator eigenvalue by one unit cell, and the Wilson loop eigenvalue won't notice because it's, it's in the exponential. So I can add to this guy an X, and then call these eigenvalues maybe theta, uh, theta k j x, over two pi or something like this. So these are the eigenvalues. Um, so in this axis element integer, these are the eigenvalues of the position operator. So the position operator spectrum is basically a repetition of the spectrum of the Wilson loop uh, with, the, with integer spacing, okay? So, uh, so if the Wilson loop has, so I say I have these unit cells, right? And the Wilson loop maybe has two eigenvalues, one here and, 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 and one here, then that's the spectrum of the Wilson loop or the logarithm of it, and then the position operator means that I have these Vanier centers each time, in each, uh, you know, in each unit cell, right? Okay, uh, it's time for an example, I think, to uh, reduce the confusion a little bit, and, uh, and the example um, uh, that is rather canonical in 1D is that of a 1D chain with, uh, with a dimerized uh, hopping, or with a, with an alternating hopping. So um, let's. Uh, make an example. Um, and that's the one D chain. Okay. And um, so I want to have atoms, and I think of spinless electrons as hopping on these atoms, and I have each time I have a strong bond and a weak bond, a strong bond and a weak bond, and the, the weak bond is coming with a T hopping integral, the strong bond, or you know, two different bonds, let's say, they can also be the other way around, uh, is T prime, and then so the two, two atoms in the unit cell, I'll call A and B, choose it like this, okay, and it continues. So, um, the Hamiltonian that describes that thing is, uh, uh, is in, in, I'll just give you the Bloch Hamiltonian. I hope that you can, uh, you're fluent in translating between uh, real space and, and uh, momentum space. So there is nothing, there's no term in this Hamiltonian that is uh, on site that connects an orbital A and orbital A again, right? So there's zero on the diagonal and also here. So I don't want to put any chemical potential or anything, and also there's no hopping between A and A side, right? Here comes another A, here B, so it's always off diagonal. 
And then within the unit cell, I have a hopping between A and B, okay? And that hopping is of strength T. So I'll put a T here, and then to make a Hermitian, I put a T here as well. And then outside of the unit cell, I can hop uh, with, a, with a T prime from, from B to A. So, so I'll write T prime times E to the I K, okay, my one-dimensional momentum. And then to make a Hermitian here, there's T prime times E to the minus I K, okay? So are we happy with this Hamiltonian? This describes this physical situation. Um, so now that system has, uh, has an inversion symmetry, okay? And the inversion symmetry, uh, so what, what is the inversion symmetry? It's the thing that, uh, so for example, here on the, in the middle of this bond, basically I have two choices, right? I can make an inversion symmetry with respect to this point or with respect to the boundary of the Brayman zone. Um, let's say we, we choose this here. So it, it, it changes A and B, right? So the inversion will map A to B and B to A. And, um, and of course, it sends K to minus K, right? So, um, so, so the inversion will be some unitary matrix that connects H of K and H of minus K. So what is, the, what is that unitary matrix? So very good, sigma x. Okay, so that's the inversion symmetry. Okay, and then there is another symmetry which um, makes this thing the Sushrifer-Heger model. Um, and that is the so-called chiral symmetry. Now you heard about this real beast uh, which is actually not a symmetry from Alex already yesterday, and uh, that uh, was sort of a bit dubious. Um, and it remains dubious, but it's a mathematical fact that uh, I can find an operator C. Uh, okay, let me write down here, chiral symmetry. Um, that I can op find an operator C such that H of K for every k is mapped to minus h of k. Okay, so I'll change that this is spectral symmetry for that because if I have an eigenvalue at energy e, then applying uh, c to the corresponding eigenfunction gives me an, an eigenstate at minus e. And this, uh, this operator is sigma 3 in this case. So c equals to sigma 3, right? So you see that, that sigma 3 doesn't appear in the Hamiltonian and for that reason uh, it has to, it's anti-commuting, right? So this is only sigma one and sigma two uh, if you expand it. And uh, so, so this, this will serve as a chiral symmetry. Okay, so that's just a statement for now. We'll use these symmetries just in a moment. But, um, but before doing so, uh, let's uh, just calculate this, this bloody Wilson loop now in a simple case, right? Um, so, uh, and the simple case that I wanna look at is T equal to zero and t prime equal to, say, one or whatever, to t prime. So, so why can I do that? Um, well, I haven't yet actually told you what the spectrum of this thing is. Um, so, uh, so what, uh, uh, we can quickly, we can quickly maybe think about it. Um, so if t is equal to t prime, that is just describing hopping on a, on a, on a chain, right, uh, with, with no, special features, this translational invariant, right? Then I guess you would know that this is a cosine band, right? Um, uh, that, that describes the hopping. So this is a gapless point, right? If t is equal to t prime. Now if I uh, switch on a little difference between t and t prime, but first of all, I cannot look in this units in this Brillouin zone anymore because the translational symmetry is, it's, is basically reduced, right? And I have to look into this Brillouin zone, and then I have to fold over uh, uh, these, these outer parts, and I get a band that looks, in principle, like this. And, uh, and then uh, the difference between T and T prime will lead to hybridization between these two bands, and the spectrum will look something like this, generically. Okay, so this is for T not equal to T prime. So I have an insulator whenever t is not equal to t prime and the metal when t is equal to t prime. So there's some sort of phase transition at t equal to t prime. And um, so then once I have an insulator, I can, you know, 
since we are interested in topology and, and so on, um, I can uh, sort of go to a convenient limit. Here is a very convenient one uh, because basically this hopping here is switched off and only the one between the unit cells is on. So in this case, the two eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, well, first of all, the eigenvalues are plus and minus one and the eigenstates are one over root two times e to the i k and one. And then I have the eigenvalue minus one where I have one over root two times minus e to the i k and one. And, um, and now let's pick that lower band, compute the Berry. Uh, now this is abelian, of course. Uh, the Berry phase or the, the, the Berry connection, it is uh, I over two. So this two is important, right? It comes from the fact that, you know, I have a wave function that's sort of equal weight on two sides. And, and only one of them depends on k, if you wish, right? That's how it comes about, if you take the derivative. And, um, and now it's easy to calculate, um, to calculate the, the Wilson loop. Or let me just calculate minus i over 2 pi times the logarithm of w, which is minus i over 2 pi times the integral of a of k. Now that a of k doesn't even depend on k, so that is just one half. Okay, so we see that in this limit, um, we get one half. And that is basically for t uh, less than t prime. Now what would happen for t uh, larger than t prime? There we can go to the limit where, um, where for example, t prime is zero, and then the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on k, and hence there cannot be any Berry connection and, and so immediately we can compute that this um, Wilson loop um, will be zero in this limit, okay? So, so we, we can see that for t uh, less than t prime, uh, we have one half. For t larger than t prime, we have zero. Now you can be suspicious and say, well, maybe that one half or something that has to do with your, uh, your special limit that you took, right? I mean, I went to, um, uh, went to take this uh, t equal to zero limit. But actually, um, one can show that uh, because of the inversion symmetry, this uh, quantization is enforced. So, uh, so inversion symmetry, what does it do uh, to this Wilson loop? It reverses the path along which I integrate, right? And um, so, uh, so let's say it reverses the k path in the Wilson loop, and and hence what it does, it generically is it will take your uh, Wilson loop eigenvalue theta of uh, k, and uh, uh, now this is the k with the arrow, and this is an equation that's more um, that goes beyond one dimension. That's why here we don't even have that k anymore because the one dimension we have integrated out, and this is equal to minus. Uh, theta at minus k, okay? So that would be the general relation that inversion symmetry enforces on the Wilson loop spectrum. Of course, are all modulo two pi. And now that means for our case, um, so we only have one theta. We don't have a k dependence anymore. There's only the kx that we integrated over. Um, for our case, this means that theta has to be either zero or pi, right? These are the only values compatible with this relation. And so we have examples uh, for both cases. Okay. Now, um, now what does that mean physically? Um, so basically, uh, we've heard that this is to do with the Vanier center. So, so when we look at the, uh, the, our unit cell, um, then for t larger than t prime, Basically, our one-year center is sitting in the middle of the unit cell, and for t less than t prime, our one-year center is sitting somewhere, is, 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 is basically at the boundary, exactly at the boundary at this other inversion center. Um, and this has an important consequence once we open up the system, um, because uh, at half filling, because we, we are obviously we are filling the system halfway, right? If we, if we want to be, uh, you know, filling only the lower band. When you think about terminating the system, 
you have you know always these vanier centers that are situated that are centered in the middle of these bonds, if the of these bonds or the unit cell end, ends, but then at the end you have kind of the vanier center that you cut in half, right? And uh, what that basically tells you is that at half filling you will have basically a half um, half charge at the end. Okay, and that leads to this polarization uh, that that Ivo mentioned uh, yesterday, right? So the polarization. Um, is is then one half basically times the length of your or the dipole moment is one half uh, times let me say d, d for the dipole moment is one half times the length of your your system uh, plus minus of course because you kind of you know it's only modulo one that statement um, so is that now um, uh, what what do symmetry what what is the role played by symmetries here so we found out that there is this polarization, which is quantized by inversion symmetry. But now all of a sudden I'm talking about an end state and you might think, oh wait, this is topological, right? It's a topological end state. Uh, but uh, for that to be true, we actually have to invoke uh, chiral symmetry. So, um, so there's two, basically two things that we have to uh, carefully distinguish. One is the quantized uh, dipole moment in the bulk, which is quantized just by inversion symmetry and the presence of an end state. And that end state uh, is immediately clear if, again, in this limit, t equal to zero, t prime, uh, you know, not equal to zero, we have an end state and it's entirely localized on the last side, right? So that the, we have this situation in the sushrifa hager model and it keeps going in this direction, but there is this state that doesn't that operator is not in the Hamiltonian, right? So this state is at zero energy, okay? So basically if I want to, yeah, so at, uh, this is a state exactly at zero energy. But uh, what protects it from being at, at zero energy, of, of moved away from zero energy? So inversion symmetry doesn't do that because the end of the system breaks inversion symmetry, right? So I cannot say that inversion symmetry protects the state at, at zero energy, exactly in the middle of the gap. What uh, can protect it is the chiral symmetry, okay? So remember that the chiral symmetry is sigma three, right? So it acts like, uh, it acts like plus on this last side. So this thing, uh, is a plus one eigenvalue, eigenstate of, of C. And uh, so the spectrum of the whole chain would basically look like some, some bulk stuff, then there is this end state and there is more bulk stuff that would be the energy spectrum of this whole chain. And all these states in the bulk, with respect to, to the chiral symmetry, they are not eigenstates, right? Chiral symmetry maps any state here to a, to a state up there and, and so on. An eigenstate of C I can only find at zero energy if it's supposed to be localized. And, uh, and so, so here I have found one. It's, it's isolated, locally isolated, and everything else is gapped near it. And so it cannot move it away as long as I preserve C, okay? So, so that's, that's the important distinction basically that, that we have to um, be aware of. The distinction between uh, the bulk uh, dipole moment being quantized just by inversion symmetry and the fact that there is a topological end state, in this case the Sushrifa Heger end state, which is protected by this additional uh, chiral symmetry. Okay, now um, that was the discussion of, of 1D. Um, maybe another, let me see, how am I doing with time? Uh, 
Um, so are you talking about one dimension? Yeah. Okay, uh, so in one dimension you always have to have a spectral symmetry to protect uh, an end state. It could be a particle hole symmetry uh, or a chiral symmetry. But a topological state in one dimension always, or even in general, is sort of a zero dimensional topological state always needs uh, uh, some spectral symmetry to be protected. It, in, in the uh, superconductor, it could be a particle hole uh, symmetry, uh, but yeah. Because in two dimensions, you have spectral flow, right? Like in the quantum hole edge, but, but here you don't have that. And so to, to pin a state at a specific energy, you need, uh, you need a spectral symmetry. Ah, okay, uh, so you see it uh, basically from this drawing. Um, so, so suppose, um, so the Hamiltonian in this limit is only uh, consisting of uh, terms that hybridize this side with this side and this with this. So this last side or this operator is not acted upon with the Hamiltonian, okay? So this degree of freedom, this in the Hilbert space here is the Hamiltonian doesn't act on it, so it doesn't cost energy to either populate it or not populate it. Okay, so that is one sort of single particle level that's sitting just at the end. And now I can make a perturbative argument. Once I've established this in this specific limit, um, I have this eigenstate of eigenvalue plus one of this uh, chiral symmetry at the end. Now if I change the Hamiltonian, preserving the chiral symmetry and preserving the spectral gap, this, uh, by spectral continuity, the state has to stay there, right? So I can now say, okay, this is my diagram for T equal to zero. Now I switch on T um, and draw what happens to these energy bands. Well, they can wiggle a bit, but as long as this gap uh, is, is, is retained, um, this state has to stay there because of chiral symmetry, because it's the eigenstate of chiral symmetry. If it would go up in energy, for example, or go down, the chiral symmetry would be broken because it's a spectral symmetry, right? But did, did you understand why the state is there in the begin, to begin with? Like putting an electron here or, or not putting it is the same energy because it's not in the Hamiltonian, this operator. Yes, yeah. So now, well, I have to know. So the Wilson loop gives you the, the, the polarization in the bulk. And whether that polarization corresponds to a topological end state depends on whether you have the chiral symmetry or not. So it's a question. You need to know what symmetries you have to interpret correctly the Wilson loop uh, result. OK, cool. Um, now let's uh, go to 2D. So in 2D, uh, we have the spectral flow. We have churn insulators as we heard yesterday, and um, I just want to uh, sort of tag onto this a little bit. So um, we have, uh, we are looking at a two-dimensional system which displays a, which is supposed to display a quantum Hall effect. So um, uh, this two-dimensional system I conveniently wrap already on a, uh, on a, on a cylinder um, and uh, and I pose that it has a, a whole conductivity sigma xy equal to e squared over h times a churn number c. Okay, that's what we learned yesterday. And, um, and now uh, I uh, know that uh, if, I, if I wrap it on, a, on the cylinder, uh, the momenta, uh, if, I, if I use periodic boundary conditions, are uh, given by two uh, pi over the length of this or the circumference of the cylinder times n, where n is an integer. But if I insert a flux in this system pi, then this changes the boundary conditions. After an electron going once around, it picks up this, this extra phase 
So uh, this is for periodic boundary conditions. And with, with phi uh, twisted boundary conditions, then the allowed momenta are 2 pi over L uh, times n plus this flux phi over phi naught. Phi naught being the, the uh, flux quantum, right? And uh, so this is now a K that depends basically on n and phi. Okay, KY that depends on n and phi. And uh, so now I, I can ask myself, um, what is the charge uh, that, is, that is transported, right, uh, from here to here when I do a full flux insertion? Well, this is exactly, this is supposed to be the churn number, but um, how can I compute it? I can basically look at the position um, of each electron, right, and I can ask, like, you know, by how much, if I integrate uh, the position along the x direction, uh, uh, how much current is going through the system in this, uh, as, I, as I twist phi from zero to two pi, okay? So this is, uh, this is a way to count how much charge I get. So, the, um, so, the, so we, we already figured out that the position is this, uh, uh, is the theta, right? Our, our eigenvalue of the Wilson loop at uh, ky that now depends on phi and, uh, and n. And then I have a certain number of those eigenvalues, maybe, that I label by J. And, um, and I have to sum over all these, these J bands. And then um, I uh, want to, so this is the position. So the, uh, the current will be uh, what uh, the, the phi derivative of this integrated over all phi uh, from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, and, um, and then I also want to sum over all these electrons that I have. So I have uh, one over L times sum over N uh, electrons. So this would be the total charge, right? So this is the, this again was our position eigenvalue. So now I can ask the total charge that's pumped. And um, so if I, I have to sort of, you know, transfer this integral from phi to an integral over ky um, using this formula. And, and what I obtain then is sum over j integration from 0 to 2 pi dky um, theta of ky j dky over 2 pi. And this has to be equal to my churn number um, uh, C, right? So, so basically, um, this is the, the you know another way of relating the position to to the whole response, and um, and this again in in the case where there's only one band, right? This was the integral over uh, k x of a of x, right? Uh, you, you, you remember that. So that was, that was the eigenvalue of the Wilson loop. And, uh, and that is now, um, oh, basically I forgot, sorry, I forgot the ky. Sorry, this should be partial ky. Okay. Um, and now you see that, uh, that I basically have half of the formula for the churn number already. So it, it's, uh, well, the part that I have is um, partial ky a of x integration uh, of d2k, okay? But um, this is not a gauge invariant uh, uh, expression, and we saw yesterday the gauge invariant way to complete this would be partial kx a y. Uh, so so the, the, way, the reason why this doesn't, uh, basically doesn't appear to be gauge invariant here is that I've chosen a specific uh, gauge that uh, where, where all the winding is contained in this uh, in this one direction, and the ay is basically not uh, winding in this specific gauge that I use for the Wilson loop. But uh, in all, so basically, um, in all generality, of course, I have to write something that's gauge invariant, and um, and actually now I can also give you the non-abelian version, which would contain a trace here. Okay. 
So that's for these, all these different eigenvalues, J. Um, okay, so that's the, the churn number of these bands. But now how do we actually uh, sort of um, pictorially understand this? So we have um, uh, this uh, Ky. It goes from 0 to 2 pi. And, um, and now in the x direction, we have all these unit cells, right? So 0, 1, 2, and so on. And suppose we have only one occupied band, then, then uh, you know, we have uh, the same uh, position eigenvalues uh, or Wilson loop spectrum uh, at 0 and 2 pi. But um, for this winding to be uh, sort of, you know, give us some non-trivial churn number, I cannot just connect them like this, right? Then this, this winding number would be 0. But for example, to get a churn number 1, I have to connect them like this, right? And, uh, and so on. So that, that is uh, how basically the charge gets pumped from one side of the cylinder to the other side of the cylinder. Um, and now it's kind of um, uh, already a little bit suggestive because I think uh, everybody of you has seen a churn uh, insulator or quantum hall band structure sketched like this, right? Uh, I guess everybody has seen that before, where this is meant to be the energy. This is the momentum, in our case, in the Ky momentum. And, and so there is a, a state that's, that's flowing, uh, an edge state, right, that's, that's flowing across, uh, across the spectral gap in the bulk. And uh, so, so this looks somewhat familiar, right, if you turn this around. Um, the only problem is that, uh, that here are so many more bands, and here we have basically the bulk and only one traversing one. And, uh, and, and in fact, there is, a, there is a very strict relation between these two things. So uh, the one being the Wilson loop spectrum, right? That's essentially the Wilson loop or the projected position operator spectrum, and that's the, the energy spectrum uh, of the system. And... Um, I'm not sure whether I have enough time. How much more time do I have? Uh, zero. zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I might. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll do this in the next lecture then. Um, okay. So so then we'll start next time with with sort of making this a little more rigorous. This connection between the the, the Wilson loop spectrum and the actual edge spectrum, which is basically showing that the the, the Wilson loop spectrum corresponds to the boundary spectrum, or as a one-to-one -one corresponds to the boundary spectrum of a topological system. Okay, so uh, questions for that part so far? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, so you're, Yes, it's basically the same uh, thing, yeah. Well, so, so the, um, okay, there's two things. The, the winding number is actually a little more powerful than the Wilson number in this case because it's, uh, the Wilson uh, eigenvalues are only modulo, uh, modulo 2 pi defined, right? The, the winding number takes advantage of the chiral symmetry and uh, for that it's an integer. Um, well, the non-abelian uh, nature, um, I think we'll, we'll see an example uh, later today where the non-abelian nature is, is really key. Uh, for here, uh, for this one, of course, the, the non-abelianness is really not playing a, a large role because you are basically just summing over all the occupied uh, this and bands. So, so the, these bands are all sort of counted the same, right? I mean, you could have, if you had now two, huh, then, uh, then you could have another one that, that, does, that does this also, right? And then, uh, then the churn number would be two, right? Or, or uh, by the way, another way of getting a churn number two would just be with one, right? That that goes by two unit cells, right? So you have a picture like that. That would also be churn number two. But um, yeah, so so here the the, the non-abelianness is not so important. It's just to keep the theory general. But we'll have a, an example later uh, where it is important. Invariant, they are 
there are ways to calculate them and they are all uh, equivalent, they lead to the same result. But uh, what would you say is the, is the advantage of this uh, Wilson teacher and uh, mm -hmm. when it's the more suitable to do so uh, it's useful if, uh, so it's really useful for numerical computations. Um, a lot of the invariants that you see, so here you formally you saw that there is a derivative in this, in this Wilson loop, but um, uh, it's actually, I wrote the, the formula with the projectors and you can just plug that in a computer and, and you don't have to take care, for example, of having a smooth gauge or something like this. Um, many other invariants require taking derivatives and, uh, and this is usually numerically not doable because if you don't have a smooth gauge, you cannot take a sort of a discretized derivative of a Berry connection or something like this. So the advantage of the Wilson loops is, is, is really a practical one um, in that sense. But it's very important if you want to, you know, if you have a Hamiltonian or, or a real material and you want to know whether it's, it's topological or not, this is much more convenient to calculate uh, than, than many other things. Thank you.